monsters keep appearing All to be a dungeoneer Whose stories will be told what? Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. I'm here to ask and answer one simple question. WTF is a Guild of Dungeoneering. It may have the best menu song of all time. That's certainly a possibility. That could be disputed. But regardless, I'd like to know how good a game it is. It's by a company called Gambrinius. And some people might have been fooled into believing, having a look at screenshots, that it was some kind of strategy or management builder game. It is not. It's actually a card game for all intents and purposes. It uses a card system for almost everything. But you have the ability to construct the dungeon that your hero is running through using a selection of cards. And there are some elements of strategy to that. Probably best just to go into the game to show you how it works. Here's the options menu. <laughs> You're done. That's the options menu. Oh my, that is missing everything. Yeah, so resolution options missing. It binds itself to whatever your monitor resolution is. So for recording, I turn my monitor resolution down to 1080p and I feel dirty. I need a shower for doing that. Blech. Disgraceful. Whatever the case, it is lacking in that it doesn't have a windowed mode. That is coming in a patch tomorrow. By tomorrow, I actually mean today. So it should be out by now, in theory. Traveling through time, it's possible that they may have been late on it. But they are aware of that. But yes, it's... It's missing, like, everything. It's a mouse-driven game, and it is also bound to 30 frames per second. I feel, of course, obligated to tell you that. Does it matter? Subjectively, not a great deal. Now, it always matters to some extent. Always. Uh, without question. It's always going to be nicer to play a game at 60 rather than 30, but in a turn-based card game, does it make a lot of difference? No, it does not. No, it does not particularly negatively affect your enjoyment of the game. It just would be nicer. If it ran at 60, it would be smoother, it would be more responsive. But there you go. That information is there for you to do with as you will. This is your guild of dungeoneering. So you construct your guild out of various rooms. It doesn't really seem to matter in what order. And you expand the guild using this menu right here. And all of these rooms, tier 1 rooms, tier 2 and tier 3 rooms, all give you all sorts of different things. Now, for the most part, they unlock classes and they unlock buffs which are kind of themed to those classes. So the training yard unlocks the bruiser class, who is a guy that punches people for the most part, and his buff is the warrior spirit. What that does is the first two battles that you have in a dungeon, you'll gain plus one physical attack. Same with the magic side of things. This unlocks the mime, this unlocks the apprentice, and at the next level, and I believe you have to unlock both classes to unlock tier two, once you can afford it, which will take you quite some time, you can unlock tier two classes. And all of these classes start with different cards. That's essentially the only real difference outside of some passives. So you can also buy these loot shops, which are going to unlock more items that could drop. I've got all of these, all of the uncommon items unlocked. These are rares, these are epics, or, and the artificio workshop, which I assume is some kind of crafting thing. I'm nowhere near getting that. It's going to take a while to get. This is about three hours into the game, by the way. So that's the level of construction. Not a lot of strategy here. It just really comes down to what you want to buy first. You know, do, do you feel like playing the mime class? Then get the mime first. You know, do you feel like playing the apprentice? Get the apprentice and so on and so forth. They're all good in different situations. Okay, so what's the meat of the game? Well, beyond upgrading this, which gives you the sort of roguelite progression element that allows you to gain something every time you send a dungeoneer into a dungeon and it'll probably get horribly eaten by demons, then you've got this, which is the... I wouldn't call it a map screen, really, but it shows you which dungeons you can enter, and you'll unlock more as you beat more, and you level up, and you gain more tiers in your guild of dungeoneering. So, let's run in somewhere, shall we? Let's go and check out this place. We can enter this dungeon, this chest. This has a dungeon chest full of loot. Wonderful, wonderful. So I can pick from the different classes. You can pick chump if you wish. You start with this. There is no reason to do that. The chump is objectively worse than every other class. It really is. All of these guys start with different things. So the cat burglar has a particular trait, which allows... Uh, it's a shame you can't actually bring that up here. That would be convenient, but... It has a trait which allows you to get an additional loot drop that you can pick from. The Apprentice starts with Fire 1 Magic, so that's a couple of Magic cards, and that also means that the equipment that you gain is going to level up your Fire skill quicker, and I'll explain how that works in a minute. And the Bruiser has something called Spiky, as well as, again, a bunch of cards of his own, and Spiky means every time you fully block an attack, it does one damage to the enemy. You can also take one Blessing in, 
So we're going to take Warrior Spirit. Okay, and we're going to go in with the Bruiser here. Okay, so let's dive into the dungeon, shall we? So this is the dungeon, and you generate the rest of it. You see, you see it's kind of missing rooms here. Well, in order to reach these rooms, I'm going to have to connect them up with room cards. So I have a corridor here that I can place, which will allow me to go and uh, say hello to the owl bear over there. or the I think it's actually a bear owl, but there you go. And I can also place down monsters. Why on earth would I want to do that, you ask? Why would you want monsters to fight? Well, you need monsters to gain loot and to level up. Every time you level up your hero, you gain an additional hit points. So that's pretty important. And you also get loot drops. And there are four little places where you can have loot. Offhand, head, weapon, and body. And the way that the loot system works in this is that loot has attributes. And... These attributes correspond to sets of cards. So the more of a particular type of item you have, the more of that card set you get. And you get the really powerful stuff. Like, say, for instance, I was playing The Apprentice, and I collected a bunch of stuff which gave me fire skills and leveled my fire up to level 4. I'd unlock something like a flame strike, which is like a 4 damage attack that's unblockable. So you can mix and match, and you often have to early on because you really don't have much of a choice. But you want to try and collect sets that work well with your abilities. Like, for instance, with this guy... If I block physical attacks fully, I do damage. So maybe I want something like a shield that will give me a lot of block attacks and all that kind of thing. So I'd look into the armor suit and things like that. Okay, so let's move. So your hero automatically moves in the direction of treasure. So he's going to be going in this direction. Now you can lure him in different directions by getting treasure cards. So if you want to divert a hero around an obstacle, like say... It would be nice to divert him around the, the Fountain of Decay, which is a negative debuff. I could do that, but I'm not going to. I would like to show you how that works, and he's going to wander off. All right. Watch your goblin. I'll be having me brother bash you, mate. All right, give him a smack. All right, so we now fight the goblin. Now, how we do this is with our deck of cards. You don't get to see what's in the deck of cards, but each class has their own small deck, and you enhance that by getting equipment. So... The enemy also has a deck of cards. This guy is going to use Anger, which means he's going to do one damage to me, physical, but he's also going to take one hit point worth of damage. Now, I can block this by using you try and something, and that will trigger Spiky, which means he's going to take two damage. There you go. And down goes his life points. Now, the battles are very, very simple in the way that they work. You simply hit the enemy until he dies, and you hope that you don't die at the same time as him. Now, it is possible to avoid that by using a card that has the quick modifier, which means you attack first, but otherwise, you attack simultaneously with your opponent, which means that you can both die at the same time, and that happens quite often. It's dead. That means it's going to drop three pieces of loot. I was talking about this armor earlier, and get a wooden board. That's armor one. There we go. Now I have Repel. So if I get more armor, I'm going to unlock more cards from the armor set, which is going to give me more powerful stuff. And it's sort of like a, a light deck builder in that way. All right. So we're moving in this direction. We want to kill the Owlbear, but I don't want to kill it quite yet, if at all possible, because it's a level three creature and I'm maybe not as leveled up as I want to be yet. So he's going to go in this direction instead. There we go. He's going to fight a level two monster, but I'd like him to fight this level one Fire Imp first because I want more stuff and I'm pretty confident that I can fight that. So I'm going to click end turn and there we go. And it's going to move along. Thank you very much, and we're going to get into a bit of a scrap with it. And the Fire Imp, of course, has different attributes and all sorts of things. Like I have Decay on me, which kind of sucks, but I should be able to deal with that. I can block that using Nice Try Chump. That's a magical attack. So I block that nice and easy. This is a magic and physical attack. So I'm just going to hit him in the face. And there's a degree of strategy involved in this, although there's also a fairly large element of luck, especially at the start of each dungeon. Every time you run a dungeon, everything that you've got on your hero resets. So... Your levels reset, your equipment resets, and you start with your basic set of cards again. It is entirely possible that the cards that you draw at the start with the monsters that you get and the cards that you then draw from your basic deck in battle will result in you losing through no fault of your own. Now, you can mitigate this to some degree by not placing down certain monsters and, of course, by taking a buff into the dungeon, but that does not necessarily mean that you are always going to be okay. It's not fair. No, it isn't. It's definitely, definitely not fair. And the game expects your characters to die, but it mitigates that somewhat by designing it in such a way that it doesn't really matter if your character dies. You gain a little bit of gold when your character dies and it's replaced by a new one. Because the whole idea is the Guild of Dungeoneering sucks. They're absolutely dreadful at what they do. And all of the worst heroes in the land come to the Guild of Dungeoneering to basically die. <laughs> oh, so... It's a bit morbid, but 
you know, they all believe they're better than they are, and that's that's the, th the theme of the game that carries it through. And it's actually really nice, because the dialogue of the various monsters and bosses also reflects this. At the start of the game, there's a monster that's panicking. It's like, oh no, the Ivory League is here to kill us. Wait, what? You're from the Guild of Dungeoneering? Ah, throw him out. Throw him out with the trash. That sort of thing. Which is is pretty funny, I've got to admit. The theme is is very nice, and obviously the aesthetic is, at least in my opinion, entirely, entirely subjective, gorgeous. The sketched style works very, very well. Of course, it's supposed to be reminiscent of pen and paper, I think, and it does a really, really good job of doing that. I might actually die here. That is possible. But no, we can drop it. Nice. There we go. We can block this one. Nice try, chump. And we're going to try and keep blocking this as much as possible. If I Now, the best card here, you know, this is where the strategy comes into play. What is the best card to use here? Any of these cards would be okay, but this is objectively the better card to use. Because not only do I block this, which means he takes damage, but I also do damage myself. So there's a little bit of decision making involved in it, but most of it is fairly logical. And it's just a case of avoid doing something stupid. Like, for instance... If you're going up against an attack that you can't really mitigate in any way and you have two cards, one which is do one damage and one which is do one unblockable damage, you use the one damage because you might need the unblockable damage later. Ooh, possible armor here, possible hit points actually. It does add stupidity to me though, so that'll actually add two negative cards into my deck. That might be, I think that's good enough anyway. It's plus two HP, I'm okay with that and I don't really want to replace any of the other stuff and I don't really want this. You know, that's magic and I'm not really developing that, so... There we go. Uh, it's, it looks so dorky. It's, it's just lovely. Ah, Skullcap, which is actually better. So I'm immediately going to replace that with something that gives me armor 2 and armor 3 and doesn't give me those stupidity cards. There we go. <laughs> lovely. That's basically how the game works. You know, for all intents and purposes, that is how the game works. He's going to wander back in this direction right now. I can't put this here because it's got to connect to every single room. So we could put a Bandito in the way. This might be a mistake because... He's, he's a little bit tough. He's a level 3 monster, but that hopefully gets me better treasure. So we'll go and do that. So there's a little bit of risk-reward involved in it. There's a little bit of decision-making in it. There's a whole lot of luck involved in it. And there is that element of progression because you're going to be basically doing the same thing over and over and over again. So do I have criticisms of it? Well, the first criticism that I have is that all of this stuff that's going on right here could be done quicker. Like, there is a delay because of the animations bet uh, between everything happening on the screen. Oh, now I cannot block that, which sort of sucks. So I'm going to do... I, I, could, I could block one attack, though. There we go. I'll do that. So battles take longer than they really should, as far as I'm concerned. That blocks everything. Cool. So he's actually going to take some damage, and I'm going to draw an extra card. This could be done quicker. Now, and after you've seen the animations the first few times, they do start to get a little bit irritating and it means the battles just drag on longer unnecessarily because every time one of these things happens you're sort of wasting several seconds when you don't need to and that does add up I know that sounds maybe a little bit petulant but it really does add up there's absolutely no doubt about that hmm, which one to go for can't be killed unless on one hp that's pretty good but i'm gonna get the sword i think i want to do a little bit more damage there we go so I've, it would be nice if they dealt with that. You know, every single little thing about all these little animations. Yeah, it's cool the first few times, but because all this entire game is nothing but running dungeons and drawing cards, these animations get particularly samey and pretty boring pretty fast. You know, it would be nice just to have a speed option where I could disable these animations and make my hero walk faster. It's nice to see those little things pop up whenever my hero has something to say. That's cute. But again, the repetition problem comes into play because we've seen those things over and over and over again. I actually like to send him back in this direction, but he's he's got his focus here on that chest. So he's going there. So it doesn't matter if I've dropped that gem there. I'm having that, mate. All right. We're going to go smack the bear owl around a little bit. Oh, we're going to try to. We should be okay. Uh, it's a, that's a pretty powerful creature, but we should be all right. We've got the levels. We've got the gear. I'm just going to block that. There we go. So we do two damage. And I'm I'm just like, by instinct, clicking here. Because I want it to go faster than it is. And it, it, it's starting to get a little bit annoying in that regard. Oh, I can't block that, so I might as well hit him as hard as I can. So that's going to cancel out that. And on and on and on and on like that. So the second complaint, again, comes down to that look element. I think that's going to be a pretty subjective complaint. I mean, you can objectively say this game requires a certain degree of luck, and this game is not entirely fair. Now, 
whether or not you are okay with that is down to your own personal preference, you know? Are you the sort of person that is only okay with difficulty that is purely reasonable and predictable and something that you can avoid with pure skill? Okay, Guild of Dungeoneering might not necessarily be for you because there is, of course, an element of skill involved in it, but there's also a whole lot of luck involved in it. And a lot of games like that, you know, there's things like Darkest Dungeon have a degree of luck to them, absolutely. Uh, XCOM has a degree of luck to it. If you're looking for a game that is devoid of luck, this is not for you. You know, there's card drafting mechanics and things like that. There's always going to be an element of luck involved in that, no real doubt. Yes, it has absolutely generated a little bit of frustration from me every once in a while. Sure. Yeah, why not? I mean, it's it's fair to say that, right? Absolutely. Because this is the sort of game that can screw you over and you'll feel like you're wasting your time as a direct result of that. We're running from the Mirics this time around. Are you the ones who looted my grandparents? Uh, possibly. Uh, I, I deny all responsibility for this nonsense. Oh, I, that's actually the wrong direction. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, maybe I can get away with it. I suppose we're about to find out, aren't we? What if I did that? I put the fire in here. Well, he still he still wants to go in this direction. Okay. So this mimic's going to come and try and eat me, but we'll try and def defeat the scary spider before that happens. I think the, the last thing that I would say I would criticize is probably just how generally repetitive it is. You are getting more loot, and you are getting more decks of cards and sort of further abilities, but class diversity, at least the tier 1, is relatively basic. You're going to get a passive, and that passive's going to do something. For instance, this passive purely affects the kind of cards that I have available to me. The Bruiser's passive, well, he, he does actually have a set of cards himself, but his passive actually affects his ability to block and do damage and things like that. You, you get the idea. It's not particularly complex. It may very well be that at Tier 2 and Tier 3, those heroes have a number of passives that make them a little bit more interesting entirely possible but you're going to be stuck at tier one for a good few hours you know it takes 500 gold to build even one tier two building and you can only do that once you've got the tier one classes from that particular tree so it does take a little bit of work no doubt about that all right we're gonna finish off the scary spider those would be my main criticisms of the game but outside of that it's reasonably innovative I would say. I like the dungeon building idea because it does introduce an element of strategy and it also means the dungeon's going to be a little bit different every time. This idea that you don't have full control of your hero and he's just wandering around like a bumbling imbecile is very thematic. I mean, the theme is definitely very strong. I don't think there's any real doubt about that. I'm going to... Let's throw wooden stool in there because I actually could use some additional armor. Uh-oh. The Mimic Queen is on its way. I should probably not go that way. All right, please run away and go and do something else. Thank you very much. You can run two squares and go and fight the fire imp there. That's, that seems reasonable. And then after that, you can go fight that mimic over there. Eventually, we'll have to fight this thing, but I don't want to fight it just yet because it's way, way tougher than I am. Things like the music is particularly adorable. I like the fact that they sing a little, a bar, a little bard's ballad every time something happens, especially when somebody dies and calls you astonishingly stupid for doing so. That That's great. That fits in with the theme quite nicely. It's particularly amusing. The game is charming, I think, in many ways. Definitely repetitive, no doubt about that. Uh, I think it's the sort of thing that I would not play in large chunks because it is doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, the basic gameplay loop is highly repetitive. It doesn't have a great deal of variety in, in it. But some is there. When you encounter different enemies, of course, they're going to have different cards for you to deal with and different playstyles that you're going to have to adapt yourself to. Uh, yeah, I think we'll get the level bound, leather bound tome there because it's going to give me a bonus to fire. That's nice. But if you're okay with the core gameplay loop of being run dungeons with this deck of cards, then you may very well find a lot to like here. It is certainly enjoyable. As I said, I would like to see the game sped up a little bit because it is a bit of a time waster. And after you've seen those animations the first few times, you really, really don't want to see them again. This could be, you know, I could be running dungeons in half the time if not for these animations. You know, it's, it's dragging things out excessively. But outside of those complaints, I think it's a, a solid little cheerful title as far as I'm concerned. An unfair solid little cheerful title. That was the wrong ability, but it doesn't matter. We're going to kill this guy anyway, I think. But it's a nice little indie game. 
with a couple of nice ideas, and it is, for all intents and purposes, a card game. So do not be fooled by the aesthetic, do not be fooled by the screenshots. This is a card game. If you're not into card games, then perhaps you may wish to avoid it. Guild of Dungeoneering, ladies and gentlemen, also known as Pitiful Hero Murder Simulator. It is available for $15 or your regional equivalent on Steam and Axiom Esports sponsor GOG. My name has been Total Biscuit. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.